Hello there, this is the former governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you're listening to John Santos, the radio on the Strong Island Radio Network. It is the most fantastic radio network of all the radio networks that are out there. So please welcome your host, John Santo. Hello, everybody. This is John Santo, and welcome to the radio. And tonight I am very happy to be joined by my special guest host. Please welcome Steve Oliva. Steve Oliva, and we're Zooming it tonight, although uh, we're audio only, but at least I can see you, Steve. How are you? Good, buddy. Good. I, um, yeah, this is my first time using Zoom as well, so through uh, Strong Island TV, so through my phone, so um, I'm glad you can see me, buddy. Yeah, I can see you. I'm on the phone, too. Uh, it looks like everybody's using Zoom these days to... Uh, to do their shows, because even though I don't live far from the studio, I can't go into the studio. Can't infect Bobby. You know, it's interesting because I actually, I was having such a hard time technologically wise because mm -hmm. everybody's doing it. I says, let me let me go see if I can buy a webcam. And they they looked at me, not looked at me on the phone. They were like, a what a webcam. Like, <laughs> It was, it was almost like, you know, I was looking, I was asking them for a, uh, like a Sony Betamax from like 81, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, the, and the Betamax was the better system too. It's amazing that the VHS. Is that right? I thought so. Yeah, the Beta was a better, uh, clearer picture. But I mean, uh, they're all garbage by today's on. standards. Why didn't it catch on? I think because VHS became like everywhere. And it's just like with the PC, like the Mac is, I think, the better machine. But because they licensed it and they and they sold them cheaper and they got you know everybody started making PCs, they became so you you would see like ten VHSs for every one two Betamax machines. Yeah, so, that's true. You know. And then the yeah. format, you know, like who who has the um, the tapes? You know, like who's the most um, the most prevalent with the number of tapes? So that became the uh, the thing. I look at but, it like the um, you know there are certain technologies as far as that goes that that in between then when that came out now that oh yeah really would just like uh just came and went they did not catch on like i'm just thinking of like i mean i'm not you know a laser lot disc the laser, laser disc. disc yes what were the big blue ones they were were they blu-ray discs were that blu-ray still around blu-ray blu -ray still yeah. maybe it's the laser disc i'm thinking of but they were they were they were like the size of an lp another technology yeah. that yeah. Right, 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 right. So you want to hear something funny? We f in my in my garage like years ago, I found an old Beatles album, LP. And my wife is like, "Well, how much is it worth?" I'm like, "I, I don't think it's worth that much." I, I looked at it on eBay; it's a couple hundred dollars at, the, at most. But it's such a piece of history. I can't part with that. You know, I don't, I don't want to get rid of that. That's like it's an LP. Beatles? It's the Beatles. Beatles vinyl, John. Yeah, vinyl. From, yeah. So. Yeah, the the big, um, yeah, the big sure. uh, thing, you know, the square, you know, the big cardboard square. Yeah, sure. Um, well, if it makes you feel any any better, years ago when I was working in the Bronx as a fireman, right, I had a stack of old uh, records, right? Mm -hmm. Though you're talking about, which everyone has tucked away in their attic or garage, like you're saying. Yep. And for some reason, I was they had I had them in my trunk. I mean, you're talking about. Helen Reddy, her <laughs> <laughs> about putting the Tijuana brass. I mean, a lot of stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, there was a Barbara Streisand. It was family, you know. So my mom, if she's listening to this, is not going to like this. But like, some guy was walking by and he's like, "Oh, those are cool albums," you know. And like, yeah, mm -hmm. I was like, uh, "Yeah, you want them?" And he, I just handed him a stack, and he just walked away like, "Wow, thanks." <laughs> like he had no idea. I gave some kid in the Bronx, some young, tough kid, walked away with a Helen Reddy record. I mean, that kid, <laughs> that kid, if he got stopped by his friends, he'd have, he'd have a lot of explaining to do. That's funny. But the uh, it, it's funny because things things will, as the, as the technology is fading out, they'll become, you know, junky or less valuable. But then as time goes on, you don't know which one of these things are going to become priceless. You know, well, like, I, I mean... Think Sure. You don't know. Well, you, that, like baseball cards, album. all of a sudden they became big uh, merchandise. Uh, 
Well, the record you're talking about, the the Beatles. What did you say? What do you think that will be worth? I think I looked it up on eBay because it's it's not it's not rare. It's common. So it was like two three hundred dollars. I think. I think I saw. You know, I didn't see anything above three. Um, I forget the name of the album. If I if I look up Beatles albums, I'll know it by sight. In fact, I might even have it in the room I'm sitting in someplace. But uh, it wasn't worth much. But I'm like. You know, if it was worth a million dollars, I would have sold it. But if it's only worth a couple hundred, I, I, I'd rather keep it. It's a piece of history. Like, you know, I don't want to sell that. Sorry, John, I lost you for a second. But, but well, what you're talking about, that, like that record. I mean, I know things have, have, have a, have a, let's say, an auctioneer, right? Yep. Or, yep. But it's the market, as they say, dictates what it's worth. So there could be some guy out there, some person that looks at, that sees that and goes, Right. Okay, what it's worth. Hold on, I think I found the... I just looked up Beatles album covers, and I know that... Here it is. It's the... Uh, it's Meet the Beatles, Capitol Records. It's, it's a black and white of all their all their pictures. It's 149 on eBay. It's not even worth what I thought it was. Some well, of them are going for 55 25 Yeah, it's not... It's a 1964... Um, and, and I don't even know what edition, you know, you know how, like you have the different prints or whatever. I don't even know which one it is, but it's not worth anything. It's just, it's, but it's, it's, you know, I, I don't want to sell it. I want to keep it, especially if it's only $20 or whatever. Listen, you know, and that's something, you know, eventually it's, it's a, a, if you want, like an heirloom, if you will. Yes. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I, obviously the rarity of it. Um, yeah, it must not be rare because now, now it's worth even less than I, Remember it being um, being worth like eBay. There's one for one forty nine, and it's that's in really good condition. Mine isn't in that good a condition. Oh, here's one for two ninety four. Here's one for fourteen dollars. So I have no idea how they well, come up with these numbers. Well, I think if it's eBay, that's that's a guy who needs a little gas money and another guy who has to pay his phone bill. Like right. it depends, depends on what's going on in their lives, you know. Now the fourteen dollar one. Looks like it's in worse condition than than the one I have, but but mine isn't anywhere near mint. It's not anywhere close. But this two ninety four one doesn't look much better than the fourteen dollar one. So I don't know how they come up with these values. Well, it's um, what they want to put out there for, right? Or is it? Yeah. Or, or you at all? Okay. You know no, what's it's, funny? The Beatles. I was never a fan, and I know there's people who are watching who may post that. Uh, you know, how could you not be a Beatles fan? But, you know, I just wasn't. But there are that. And I know some of the albums because I grew up in that, you know, in the 70s. But that mm -hmm. album, that heard of it, Meet the Beatles. Was that one of their first ones? It says 1964. But maybe they did a reprint. You know, that could be why there's a difference. This says 1964 model vinyl. And it says... Uh, meet the Beatles. That's all it says. From the uh, oh, I, I forgot to share the show on my Facebook. Oh, you did? Get it oh, up there. Oh, jeez. Yeah, I gotta get it up there now. Uh, share now. Okay, share it to my timeline. I tell you though, this is this is very stressful doing this at home. With the uh, you know, with the zoom and everything, I much I like it in the studio because Bobby's He's there. kind of on a. Bobby knows what's Bobby's the best producer, the top producer is the best Bobby. producer. Bobby is, it's a good thing he's there because a lot of us are learning on the fly, so to speak. Yep. Um, I think you though, just from what I what I think, especially with your background in um. Aeronautics, you by default have. Wow, we lost today. I heard by lot. default. By I'm default, sure you've looked at. You've looked at a, well, John, you could look at a a panel in an airplane and know what everything is, right? I surprised somebody one time when I saw a cockpit and they said, "Oh, that's a seven something," and I said, "No, it's a seven forty seven because seven thirty seven doesn't have four engines." So they like there was like a mistake. Um, it's I'll tell you a funny story. I was at the airport in uh, Florida, and I saw a. Um, I was coming back from 2015. I'm coming back from spring training back then. Uh, we'll have to save lives. 
and I'm at the airport, and a guy said to me, he goes, oh, that's a 737. I said, no, that's an Airbus. And he said, that's a 737. I'm like, it's an A320. It says Airbus right off the side. So he goes, he goes, that's a 737. <laughs> He goes, that's a 737. And that, you know, the engines are different, the cockpit's different, you know, the, the outside totally different. Plus, it says Airbus. And I said, if that's a 737, then I'm Donald Trump. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so it was an Airbus, you know. It's like well, it says it, Airbus on the front. Yeah, know? but I could have figured out the Airbus, but you knew what make it was or what model is i don't know i don't know what they call airplanes but yeah it's like a make a model for a car it's like an airbus you know a320 and then there's like different variants of of that um but it was i knew it wasn't a 737 because the 737 has different engines different cockpit all that stuff mm, see you know that's uh that's a uh, knowledgeable person looking at it i would be like that guy i would i would love to I'd love to be like Mike Francesca and say, first of all, America doesn't have the 737-800. They don't have it. They don't have it. <laughs> he would, <laughs> that's well, how he would be. <laughs> yeah, Mike has taken on Mike, – Mike Francesca has, over the years, has taken on many hats. Everything. And he, like, he was the weatherman for a while there, and he incorrectly <laughs> predicted the weather. <laughs> I did a thing. I was trying to explain stealth bomber technology to somebody, and I said, stealth only gets you. And I did it as Francesca, and I'm like, stealth only gets you so far. I said, once you drop your bombs, they know there's an airplane because they just got bombed. Okay, the stealth, they just got bombed. Hello, there's an airplane. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> I could see him explaining stealth technology that way. It's like the element of surprise got- is over. And you want to go, uh, Mike, aren't, don't, or don't you make a living talking about sports? Why are you giving out med- meteorological advice, uh, <laughs> stealth bomber technology advice? They, they know there's a plane in the sky. They just got bombed. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of aviation, I don't know if you know that next week, the 11th, I was actually supposed to be going on a cruise on the 11th, oh, which got canceled yes. out of New York. Right. Uh, April 11th, and um, that is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 13. When he fought Fifth. Rocky? No, not that Apollo. The <laughs> other one. Silly That's joke. A, you know, Silly you know, no, joke. No, no, you, 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 I think that when they go back to the moon, the first program was Apollo. The next one should be Rocky. You know, it, it, it makes perfect sense, but here's, my, here's the question. Go ahead. Because they've been to the moon, aren't they? Aren't they? Uh, and we could refer to Mike Francesca about this because he has, he would probably have have an opinion on it. But aren't they like uh, trying to go a little farther now? They go, you know, they have the, the red, the range, ro- the, the rover on Mars, and now they're going. They've been going farther and farther. It almost seems like the moon is like, yeah, we would air ready. You know, it's like going to your sister's house. But well, how we have, we have to get back to the moon, and then we're going to go to Mars. We have to get to Mars. Mars is so important. And it's funny because the audience can't see it, but I'm using my space pen. I have a space <laughs> pen. That's my space pen. This space pen was given to me by the owner, uh, the, uh, the inventor. I was in, when I worked for Aviation Week in 2003, I was at a space conference and I was working at a registration desk and Al Bean comes in, Paul 12, all these guys that worked on the moon. And then Paul Fisher, the inventor of the space pen. And he goes, you have one? I said, look at this. And he handed me one. He goes, now you have two. Because I had it in my suit pocket, amazing. Was, I met the I met the guy who invented the space man. Was he impressed that you had that? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Because he goes, "You're familiar with the space man?" I pulled it right out of my pocket. I had it right there in my pocket. <laughs> now you in didn't pull suit. Trump out, did you? What? You didn't pull the Trump uh, the Trump pen? No, Trump. that was 2003. This is I wasn't even doing Trump, but I had the I had the original. Uh, no wait, which one did I have? I had the executive. They, they make all different kinds. But the like, this is the one he gave me, which is like this different colored whatever. This is called the bullet space pen. But I have then he, he also gave me the original AG seven, which is the actual pen they used in the Apollo program. Like they make different variants of it; they're all official. But that one was the official official. So Buzz Aldrin said to me because um, I had done some work for him. I said, Buzz, could you sign my Apollo book? And right there, on he leaned up against the Apollo eleven command module at the Smithsonian. Right up again and signed it right there. I was like, "Holy shit! You know, this is incredible." Buzz, incredible. 
Because the museum had been close to a dinner that we had. Um, Buzz is out of this world. He he was he you know he did you ever see the video of him where he punched some guy in the face? The best because the guy wanted them to swear on the Bible that he didn't walk on the moon, and he, he it was in California, I think. Right? Was he it was Hollywood? about seventy eight years old when he did it, or whatever? You know, <laughs> he decked them. I didn't. I think that happened after I worked with him. I worked with him in two thousand three. I think that happened like two thousand seven, if I if I remember. Because yeah, I, I I would have asked him about it. You know, I would have asked him about that. For yeah, sure. You gotta ask him from a distance because he might swing at you. You know. Hold on, we're gonna look up when that incident took place. See, this the one nice thing about working from home is that I have my computer right here. So I can look this stuff up. When did Buzz Aldrin punch a guy? The guy's name is Brad Sebrel. Uh, he's a conspiracy theorist. Uh, let's see. Sebrel, when did this happen? Uh, Aldrin incident. Oh, no. This happened in 2002. I guess I didn't know about it. Uh, I would have asked him. Oh, this happened. Oh, because I met him December 17th, 2003. It was the 100th anniversary of the Wright Brothers. That's why we had the thing in Washington. Um, yeah, so I must have not known about it. Otherwise, I would have asked him about it. I must have you found know, out about this later. I it's mean, a this good was also thing. 20 years ago, but I don't remember. I, don't, I would have remembered. You know, a guy like Buzz Aldrin, this was a guy who's who's was in the, the inception of the, of space flight, essentially, yeah. at least in a so, you know, he's been through a lot. Oh, yeah. So he, he doesn't, uh, how should we say, suffer fools <laughs> very easily, you know? But what is the argument of... I think we're losing you. Steve is frozen. We don't hear Steve. So I will tell a quick Buzz Aldrin story while we try to get Steve the back. Like oh, that. he's com he's coming back in and out. You, you were in and out for a second. I'll tell you. I'll tell you this story about Buzz Steve. He he was the guy that came up with the idea to train in a pool to simulate weightlessness. Is that right? So yeah. So when they assemble stuff like outside the spacecraft and these guys are spacewalking, he came up with that idea. So training in a pool. You know, when I think of that, you know what I think right away? The uh, like the Navy SEAL training. Those guys have to do all that upside down yeah. in a pool. Talk about disorienting. If you can. Oh, yeah function in those uh, conditions that's a that's a big test of you you know because it's all this you ever see an officer and a gentleman when they fly them into the pool uh, to simulate going off the going off the deck of a carrier and we lost Steve is in and out I'm in and out again I'm like Buzz Aldrin in and out of that pool I mean in what is out. in and out but I hope I'm back am I back now we got you. It's like it's like you freeze for a second. But you know what's nice about doing this on Zoom, the show, is that all the shows are doing this now. So my show is just as good of a production quality as all of the other shows that are in Hollywood and, and in the main media. <laughs> well, on top of it, they you know they have a big production uh, budget than than you and I do, and uh, look look we're, we're pulling it off. You're pulling it off. My production budget for this show is, is less than a million dollars. Oh, we lost Steve again. For, for a president. I'm, I'm going to try something. Can I try to go inside, Bobby? Try to go where? Just move, or you think it'll help if I move? I think you got to be close to whatever your router you're using with the Wi-Fi. Are you on a cellular phone network or the Wi-Fi? Cellular phone network. Oh, you got to be on the Wi-Fi. That's why. Oh, I don't sucks. Have, you don't I, have Wi-Fi? Wi um, uh, that's why Stevie's so choppy. Maybe you got to go outside. You know, I'm going to go outside. I thought he was on a Wi-Fi, folks. Yeah, my, my, the budget for my show is under $10 million, under a million dollars production so, cost. Yeah, we had the same Johnny. problem last week with the uh, we we did a cell phone only call last week, and it's just terrible. I can't wait. In the studio, we have flawless sound. We have beautiful microphones. We don't have any technical issues in the studio. But um, sorry about that, folks. We're going to get Steve back as soon as we can. I could see him walking outside. 
but it's just a very uh, Bobby. He's on a cellular network. He's not on Wi-Fi. Hey, Bobby, look where I am outside. This is kind of oh creepy. My God, now it's better, way better sound. Really, my neighbors are gonna like. You know, they very rarely see me, so they're gonna <laughs> see me now. They see yes, me can, now. Can you see? Walking. Can you safely maintain six feet from everybody while you're outside? My neighbors may have been. My neighbors have been maintaining six feet for a long time from me. <laughs> well, they're going to hear you talking to yourself, so they're probably going to say, let me stay away from this guy. Yeah, it won't, it won't be the first time, you know. So you know what I thought of uh, with this whole thing that's going on with Major League Baseball shutdown is that right now, this is the first time in history that in April, my batting average is the same as every Major League player. <laughs> well, John, first of all, I zero, every, zero, zero. I bet every major league player does not have your extensive array of, uh, of med hats. No. Uh, you know what? I. You know what's funny? I do probably have more med hats than any major league player playing today. I think they get two of each. <laughs> Steve is uh, coming in and out again. I don't know. Hey, you know why? Hold on. Steve doesn't have Wi-Fi, Bobby. Who doesn't have Wi-Fi? I, I could probably get Steve some. <laughs> so, so I think during this period, Bobby, my first question to a co-host: Do you have Wi-Fi, and is your cable bill current? Yeah, really. We, we you're going to have to make sure that your guests meet certain specifications, certain technical specs. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> People in Africa have Wi-Fi. I was just going to say, I could probably get a comedian in Africa. And people in Fiji have Wi-Fi. Fiji, like from the Pacific. But we're going to get somebody like from either an Antarctica scientist, somebody in Fiji. I want to go exotic. I want people from like Africa, Fiji, the, the United Federation of Micronesia. Yeah, uh, Micronesia. Right? Those li- Micronesia, yeah. those little islands. Yeah, yeah. Right? I'll be talking to a guy and he'll be like, it, 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 like in the middle of this beautiful Pacific sunset. Hello, John. I'm talking to you from Micronesia. And you, you can probably get even one of those tribes when when they speak with the with the clicking, like that. Yeah, on the Wi-Fi. One of those kids. Yeah, they on they the click Wi-Fi. on they click over Wi-Fi all the time. That's funny. <laughs> John, <laughs> I think. St- oh, st- Steve is still choppy. I see him. This is yeah. yeah. We don't Hold even on. care about his video. It's just his audio. I mean, man. Audio is all we need because we're a radio show. I can't believe he doesn't have Wi-Fi. I just assumed. Yeah, well, you know. You know what happens when you assume. You make an ass out of you and me. Out of you and me. That's right. <laughs> but who, like, who even don't, don't like, isn't Wi-Fi like almost? Don't they have free Wi-Fi all over New York City now? Uh, yeah, there's hot spots, you know. Apparently, he's not in a hot spot, you know. He's in a very cold spot. <laughs> he's, <laughs> he's in a cold spot. Yeah, poor Steve. Poor Steve. I don't know if we can even still hear him. I I hear him, you know, rumbling around. He's going from right. room to room trying to find a signal. It's Bobby. so funny that we can get live pictures from the moon. Just so clear. <laughs> but we, we can't get Steve Oliva to we make it. <laughs> we got images from Mars that are streaming faster. <laughs> this has got to be better. Oh, that's better. There he is. Yeah, we don't have, we don't have to worry about the video. It's all audio, buddy. All audio. Okay. Okay. And I was saying that my production uh, budget is less than a million dollars for the show, which is true. <clears throat> Have you been watching the, the Governor Cuomo's press briefings? Well, he is uh, he is both competent and mildly scary at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing what we should be doing to stop the virus. I'm working on a Cuomo uh, impression. It's- it's actually it's good, John. He he does. You're right, though. He has the cadence of a social studies teacher. What we need to do is to stop people from going to the park. And when this is over, you can go to the park. It'll be back. But we have to stop the virus. He actually <laughs> said we can't go for walks. 
Yeah, well, because people aren't maintaining social uh, distancing. And uh, they said the beaches were, were, oh, you know who passed away? I, I put it up on Facebook and somehow it got removed. Um, the woman that played uh, the, the, kit, the Kittner kid's mom and Jaws died of coronavirus today. She was 91. You know, that is, I mean, clearly she was in a, in a, uh, a the vulnerable age, age range, right. but um, that, that is for anybody who grew up or watched that movie and, you know, right. kids are watching it today. That's sure. very, um, I don't know what the word is. That's very like sobering in a sense because that she only had one scene, but everybody remembers it. Right. It, her name was Lee Fierro. She was 91. She passed away in Ohio, uh, today but here's what's what's weird about it the 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 governor of florida wouldn't close the beaches for those spring breakers and they say that that helps spread the virus so ironically she died in real life because they wouldn't close the beaches wow that's some irony right there it's irony it's very ironic um you, you think she, if she went to the beach she should have went up and smacked all those she should have smacked. Well, I was going to say she's not here to smack the governor of Florida. But not cl- you knew that people could get sick. Right. He straightened out Chief Brody. She could straighten them out. You know, you know what's amazing about Chief Brody? Like, you know, Roy Scheider was in um, Jaws and nobody listened to him. Like, is it that hard to believe that it was a shock? Like, I don't understand why it's so hard to believe. Like, oh, I didn't see the tooth. That doesn't look like a shock. Why don't you just assume it's a shock? Because you know, it's not a boating accident. And and in the movie 2010, when Jupiter was going to explode, they didn't listen to him then either. It's like, why don't you just listen to Roy Scheider? Roy Scheider knows. Well, I think, you know what it is? And and this, everything that predates the internet, excuse me, uh, Twitter, social media, was handled right. so differently because you were dealing with a such an unknown, which is very much like what's going on now with this thing. It's almost an yep. invisible. So right. you would deal with the fear as opposed to being able to, let's say, like you can track sharks. They have, you know, that that uh, that app where you can actually track sharks, you know, yep. and because they detag them all. And you can see how they go up and down the East Coast line from Florida, Carolina. Yeah, they, do, they do tag quite a few of them, too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, they wouldn't have had to gone through all that where, you know, uh, uh, Brody had to get the uh, the oxygen tank right in his mouth and, and nail him with that with that gunshot. They wouldn't well, have had to go through all of that. If they would have remade Jaws, right, I, I would have made, like, Al Pacino, uh, uh, Matt Hooper, and say, this was no boating accident. This was a shock. You know, that would have <laughs> and, and Schwarzenegger could have played uh, the chief. Be like, smile, you son of a bitch. And then he would have, like, fight a bazooka. You know, he would have had a bazooka to shoot the shark. <laughs> yeah. Who would have? Who would have played? Yeah, it would have been. It would have been a two-minute movie. One yeah. sighting. Uh, well, who would have played? Um, was it uh, Richard Dreyfus? Well, I would have been Pacino. Oh no, not him. No, no. Oh, the chief. Oh, oh. The chief who met the untimely demise in the uh, in the mouth of the shark when he slid down the. the oh, the, oh, the, oh, Quint, the, uh, Quint for Quint. The, the boat, the Quint. Yeah, that yes. would have been. Um, that could have been um, – who would have played a good Quint? That could have been like uh, Sean De Niro. Ma- oh, maybe uh, – yeah, well, De Niro, maybe. It's like, he's shark. He's bad. I want 50000 for me by myself. How about Tony I'll Soprano? Give, I'll if give he- you the head, the tail, the whole damn thing. Oh, yeah, give me- I'll give you the freaking head, the tail, the whole mother effing thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was funny if it was Tony Soprano, John, like that. His, yeah. Everybody in the neighborhood would have get, had shark steaks for the next twenty years. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mitch, Mrs. Bachigaloop, he would have been showing up every day. Christopher, go get how? How would Christopher give the shark steaks to <laughs> the lady on the street? We'll chop them up at Satrielli's. <laughs> All right, let's chop them up. <laughs> That's but, you funny. Know, as, as classic as that movie was, mm-hmm. anybody listening to you right now, if you made it to like Jaws three, you you never saw such a demise of a movie as you did from one and two, which were great. I think three yeah, was two, two, two was good. Was three to three D one two yep, was great. Three, yeah, three three was three D until the shark he got electrocuted with the with the the cable. Yeah, yeah. it still had the fear. It still 
held the fear factor. The other, you know, who, um, right, so, and then four had Michael Caine. I always said Jaws 4, and Jaws 4 was horrible because in Jaws 4, the shark followed Mrs. Brody all the way down to the Caribbean and even knew her bloody flight number, the shark. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like, John, how, did, how did the shark know they were in the Caribbean? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> like, it's really, uh, it's, it's, it, you, as I heard the term in the past or the phrase, you suspend your like imagination, suspend reality, because uh, you know, just the fact that it would follow him that far is a little unbelievable. But I think it's less believable that Michael Caine took the part, the lead in that film. I can't <laughs> believe it. I doubt it was the worst mistake of my life. I thought I should have been in this film three movies ago. <laughs> <laughs> John, you gotta think about it though, in the acting world. He went from you know, I'm sure doing some sort of British theater or Shakespeare to yep. you know, chasing, chasing a fictional shark down to the Florida Keys or wherever he was. And then That's he was, a, then he got some really good parts. He was, he was, uh, he was in that uh, spy movie with Pierce Brosnan, uh, the fourth protocol, I think, which came out around the same time. So he had some good well, parts. Oh, no, no. Michael Caine, great parts. He's a suburb actor, but you know, the, the, the interesting thing about acting, if you look at IMDb, mm -hmm. you will, like your favorite actor who was in a, who was in a a memorable uh, movie or a part on TV, and then if you follow his career, even mm -hmm. afterward, they've done they've done some real, you know, some some. I mean, geez, the great Eric Estrada is selling uh, uh, reverse mortgages. I mean, come on. Now. <laughs> and he had the best teeth. When I tuned in the chips, and you saw him smiling on the bike, that man's teeth they were perfect. Listen, man, he didn't even need a flashlight. He would get out and blind people with the teeth. <laughs> His teeth were impeccable. They were yeah, perfect he was the man. Yeah, Eric Strada was the man in the day, man. The man. You know something? Interesting movie, though. Know, I actually, this is the, he is an actual, either a, an honorary deputy or an actual police officer. I'm not sure where. No, I think I think in the in the California Highway Patrol, they made him an honorary cop. I think from from the kiss of the show. Well, I think you're right. I think we'll have to look that up. Yeah, he um, he. I saw that not too long ago. You know, know it was one of those. Right uh, it was even pre coronavirus. I was surfing the internet. I'm like, what is Eric Estrada up to now? Let's check it out. Chips Eric Estrada becomes real life. This is in 2016. Real life police officer, Eric Estrada doesn't, but yeah, he's actually got a picture of him next to the bike. He's a real cop. <laughs> he's a real cop. You know, he's obviously uh, he's got to go through the training. Let um, me see. Let me see if he's got a gun. I don't know if he's got a gun. Let's see. Yeah, uh, I can't tell. It looks like he's. I can't tell if it's a gun or not. But he's got uh, the belt. I can't tell in this picture. If he's got a, uh, he's on a Harley Davidson, looks like a police bike, a white bike. He probably has teeth whitener in that belt. He's got the teeth are perfect. They're still perfect. <laughs> the teeth are perfect. <laughs> when I go back to my dentist, he goes, how do you want your teeth to look? I go, you know, Eric Estrada. I go, give me Eric Estrada from 77. Are you, are you familiar with the, um, where the airplane movies came from? Hold, hold on one second. Keep, keep going. You ever see the movie Airplane? Like the comedy? Oh, of course. Classic. Hold on. I got to show you. This. All right. I'm back. So Airplane, the comedy, um, started from the movie Airport 1975. Yes. There are, there are more references to the movie Airplane, like where they got everything from, than any other movie. And why do I bring that up? Because Eric Estrada was the flight engineer on the ill-fated 747. And uh, everything from Airplane, the sick girl, the nun with the guitar, all of that came from Airport 1975. The bomb. Was that the, because, the what? Was that, was that because it was the same director or they just kind of took the whole, every cliche well, at that? There were four airport movies. George Kennedy is the only actor that appeared in all four. There was Airport. Just, it was just called Airport. That was Burt Lancaster, Dean Martin, and Glenn Ford. Dean Martin and Glenn Ford were the pilots, and Burt Lancaster was like the airport operations guy. 
Then Airport 75, and that was a guy with a, he wanted his wife to get the life insurance, so he's going to blow up the plane with a, with a time bomb. Um, they made fun of that in Airplane 2. He goes, I'll have a, let me get a Time magazine, a Snickers bar, and the second time bomb on the left. He's like in the airport <laughs> store. <laughs> um, but Airport 75, uh, a plane hits the cockpit. Uh, they have a collision, but the plane is still flying. So Eric Estrada is dead. The, the co-pilot gets blown out of the cockpit and the captain is like barely conscious. And he goes, autopilot, autopilot as the, as the flight attendants trying to you know, figure out what's going on that they did that in airplane. When, when Peter Graves goes unconscious, he's like autopilot, autopilot. <laughs> and then this comes up. I have the, the audience can't see, but I got the little out of the autopilot balloon. <laughs> so it was a subtle, uh, a subtle, uh, uh, mocking in a sense, you know, making fun yeah. of them a little bit. Yeah, I picked that. Well, it, they, they're mocking all of those. And then there was another one, Airport 77, the plane crashed on the water and they were all alive under the water. And then Airport 79 was the Concorde. So there, there were four airport movies and Airplane makes fun of them um, in some way. You know, that's how they got the spoof for Airplane. So, so was O.J. Simpson in in that? in, in air, He was in, O.J. Simpson was in Airplane, right? No, that was Kareem Abdul Jabbar. No, no, I know, but OJ oh, Simpson was gun. no, no, N Naked Gun. He's the Naked Gun. That's what I'm thinking of because yeah. OJ Simpson was in the the Towering Inferno. I believe he played a fireman, and I remember, yes. I yes, remember he was that a they, fireman. they moved, they put him in one of those movies as well, and it was Naked Gun, right? That's what I'm thinking of. Leslie Nielsen was Leslie Nielsen. He was in both. both? Yeah, yeah, Airplane and, and Naked Gun, yeah. yeah. Wow, Eric Estrada is 71. Holy cow. Jeez, now I know I'm old. If Eric Estrada is 71. Well, he's, I guess he's selling himself reverse mortgages now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. Oh, that's funny. The, um, yeah, you know what I was thinking of? Can we talk about well, the Mets for a second for any Mets I've, fans out there? Yeah, of course. Your hat reminds me. So, whenever the base, whenever the season starts or doesn't start, right? Uh, let's hope. Let's hope we get something. Yeah. Uh -huh. Were you? What, what was your thoughts on Noah Syndergaard being out for the year? Not good. I mean, I was hoping. You know, they said he, he might have had like a bounce back year, so that's terrible loss. So did they give up Wheeler already? They, sure? Yeah, they they he's on the Phillies now. So that right. you know, if you would have known Noah was going to go down, you had to sign Wheeler. Of know? course, but they, I, I, you know, I don't know, I don't know what's going on there. Hopefully, they'll be able to you know replace those innings somehow. But we don't even know what, how much baseball we're playing here. Well, one you know, thing, and this this always amazes me, like um, the media can hype anybody, and it's very tough to live up to, right? Yeah, but you know, that's that's reality versus not reality. But when you take a guy like, I'm not going to say no, Sinegar, I like to talk about Matt Harvey just because he was so touted. And then yeah. he had those, and I don't know if he was losing his game a little bit, but then he had those injuries that, um, I forgot the name of it, but. Oh, uh, no, he had the, um, the, uh, thoracic, the upper, thoracic outlet syndrome or something, right? Right, so. Then he came back and he was playing for the Angels. I think it was his last team. I don't know. Is he? I could, you know, I always say to myself, like, I wonder if he, it cra sounds crazy, but I wonder if he would make it back to the Mets one day. They like said that they, I, you know, it's funny you mention that because I saw something on one of the fan um, things on Facebook and they said that they actually might give him a, uh, you know, does it make sense to give him a minor league contract? I don't know. You know, I look at those things like uh, I like to see it come full circle. Let him come back and maybe finish out in any capacity his career. That's yeah. wishful. To, you know, that's a, that's a fairy tale. But, I mean, who was, who, other than Dwight Gooden, I don't know, who was touted like him? I think DeGrom, DeGrom, you know, Seaver, those are your top. Uh, Just not uh, as Kuzman. flashy. Yeah, no, not as flashy. Because they, a guy, a guy, when I was in spring training, there was a fan telling me down there that that when Harvey would would come, uh, you know, he'd be leaving for the day or whatever. He'd like get on his phone and like a Maserati would pull up and his, you know, his 
model girlfriend would get out and then he'd hop in the car and drive away. Like he wouldn't sign autographs or anything. So, um, you know, I, I don't, I mean, like when we were down there just recently, uh, can't say enough good things about Dom Smith. He stopped and signed, you know, um, I, I don't know if they, if, you know, like you also don't know like what these guys are told. Cause I know like somebody said it was hard to get Pete Alonzo to sign anything, but I think because they're making so much money off of his signature, you know, right now. So no, it's, I get it. The kid, he was signing for the kids. All the kids, he was, they said he was signing for the kids, but it was hard to get like an adult. Like I went up to Dom Smith. He signed my ball, uh, you know, uh, um, Guillaume signed. I got uh, Nimmo. You know, Nimmo always signs. And well, here's the just, cynic in me. You know, a guy's got his kid. <laughs> he's got a bucket of balls and he's hiding. And he's like, all right, he changes his jacket. <laughs> yeah. Every t- every second he changes his jacket and hat has the kid go back up. Ask him again. <laughs> well, every nine balls. If I was walking the other way and I saw a group of kids running towards me, going the opposite direction, I followed them because, like the rats on Titanic. They seem to know where the players were, <laughs> you know. So I would just follow the kids. But you know, you know who's I, I ran into Tim Tuffle. Like I was following a group of kids, and I looked to the left. I'm like, oh my god, it's Tim Tuffle, and he signed up. You know, he signed my spring training ball, which is cool. So well, that was, I, w- I wish I had my '86 World Series ball. That would have been phenomenal to bring. But who well, knew? What you're t- talking about, John, is is always kind of follow the people, regardless in any who know what they're looking at, who know where they're going, not what everybody else is doing. You got to right. follow well, these, so these you're, little kids that were like eight years old and they knew they, pff, like a whole pack of them. Well, John, then I'm going to throw this at you. You remember years ago when president Clinton was coming to a diner in Queens? Yep. In the, in the early nineties. So I, I sure do. I remember that very well. Mr. President, do you remember Mr. President? When yes, I do. all the people were in front of the diner, thousands of them wanted to meet you. And, and a couple of local kids from the neighborhood went to the other side thinking that you would be there. And there you were where nobody was. And I That's came right. up to you. I appreciate because, that. Because that diner has great burgers. And there's one thing I love, and that's a great burger. Well, I found it interesting you asked me for my sister's phone number as well. That was a little strange. Well, that's true. I call a lot of sisters. <laughs> I called somebody. I'll tell you a true story. My friend was up from Washington, and he goes, oh, you got to call my, I think it was like his sister-in-law or something, because she wrote a letter to Barack Obama. It was right after Obama became president. So, we, you know, his coworker had a, another, a different BlackBerry, but also with a Washington, D.C. 202 area code phone number. So I said, yeah, I'll call. So I'm like, uh, so one person introduced the call. Um, they knew she wrote Obama a letter and it's like, Oh, you know, the president responds to a couple of letters a week and he got your letter and he'd like to speak to you. So I'm like, oh, hello, is this Mary? This is Barack Obama. She's like, all of a sudden there's like a pause and she goes, I'm on the phone with Barack Obama. She goes <laughs> in her office. That's beautiful. And they, they put me on speaker. I'm like, oh, I just want to thank you for your letter. And we're going to do exactly what you suggested in your letter. <laughs> You know, you almost felt bad that, like, when she found out it really wasn't him. Well, there's a flip side. There's another part of that story. They never told her. They never said it was a gay. You know? Like, like a year later, like, the next time he was up for that particular meeting, I said to him, like, hey, uh, what did you, you know, how did she take it when she found out it wasn't him? He's like, "Uh, I never told her. (laughs) I guess it's a Santa Claus thing. You can't tell her it wasn't real, you know? So I, I hope she doesn't listen to the show. She just yeah. found out listen. 11 years later. Uh, you know, she's been living on that on that phone call for 11 years. Well, how do you tell her now? You can't tell her now. You know, 11 years later. Let me ask Mr. President Clinton. When you were in Queens, what was your favorite thing about, uh, about flushing Queens when you used to go by? Steve, I have to say that your firehouse in Queens was my favorite stop. You guys make good meals. I love fire department cooking. I love junk food. Well, you know, when the firemen used to slide the pole, you mentioned that uh, you've never been in a firehouse, but you were in plenty of places where they had poles where people were jumping on. I mean, I don't know. Is that true? Plenty of places that they had poles, except usually the people weren't so well dressed. <laughs> And there were there were hoses, but <laughs> a 
different kind. <laughs> a different kind of hose. A deuce and a half. <laughs> hey, do you know um, the Golden Gate Bridge behind you, John? Yeah, so on Zoom, you can, yeah. when you first go into it on the phone, Bobby said he can't do it on the Like, he didn't see it on the laptop, but I saw it on the phone. So the Golden Gate Bridge comes up automatically. You can also do... Like if I, if I'd have to log out, I don't want to do it now, but I could, I had the Met logo behind me because it was a picture on my phone. So I had the, like the, you know, the city skyline Met logo, but you got to be careful, Steve. You got to make sure you pick something. I don't know what you have on your, in your photo album on your phone. You got to make sure it's the right picture because it's the, look at this background. It's huge. It's well, huge well, background. What a big background. It's so big. No, I like it. It's, it's nice. And for a Met fan, you know, it's pretty cool that you have a San Fran, uh, uh, background but you know some yeah nobody what? wants to see you know me I, I don't have wi-fi so nobody wants to see uh you know all the uh the pictures that have been going around on group tests you know you know <laughs> nobody wants to see any of those and, and i think i deleted all the ones that guys would send me but <laughs> yeah. uh, it, there's a few there's a few that are making the rounds all through the world and nobody wants <laughs> to see them. well my one of my friends she she said like she does this dating, she's dating or whatever. And she said, you know, guys will send me pictures of their thing. And I'm like, really? I'm like, I, I think that, that, that those, the a dick pic is really like a Star Trek movie. Most women don't want to see them. <laughs> yeah. I've heard those people say that, you know, friends of mine. And, and even if it was a friend of mine, I go, I go, don't do that. Nobody wants to see that. Nobody, Nobody wants to see that. Nobody. Nobody. But uh, hey, yeah, so, know, so what? Well, go ahead. Um, I was thinking, do you know when I was a kid, who did anybody ever throw you a baseball as a kid, like a memory when you were a kid? No, no. That's why I don't. I don't agree with that thing where if you catch a baseball at a game, you got to give it to the nearest kid. Nobody gave me a ball. People <laughs> caught balls near me when I was a kid. I had a, you know what? I got my first baseball at a baseball game in 2015 when, when John LaRocchia took me to, he had third row Delta platinum, like right behind the on deck circle in, 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 in the July game when Wilma Flores hit the walk off home run against the nationals. And, mm -hmm. and, and it was extra innings. Okay. So you know how many things had to happen for me to get that ticket one, nobody, his wife didn't want to go to the game. None of his kids wanted to go to the game. And he asked me to go to that game. And just by chance, my cousins that I hadn't seen in, in many, many years were sitting right in front of us. Same seats right in front of us. The statistical probability, this is mind-boggling. The game goes into extra innings. In the top of the uh, 11th inning, a ball boy throws me the ball. Maybe the top of the 12th. I got to look. Throws me the ball. I have the ball. I put it right in the cube, right in the car. Cube. I had to wait 40 something seasons for that ball. So no, I'm not giving it to a kid. Let the kid wait 40 years too. I, I do understand your sentiment because you waited so 40 long. years. Now the next time I get a ball, yeah, I give it to a kid, but they should have a thing like where you, the, you, you check like a box, right? No, this is my first ball. I'll sign an affidavit. Um, <laughs> like a notarized thing. Well, but but you're on TV and you can't explain I, yourself on TV. You, they you look like the mean person that didn't give it to the kid. You know. Oh yeah, it could be it could be a terrible uh, a terrible little bite. You know. That's why I have like a little card in my wallet. Forty years I waited for this ball. Stop breaking my balls. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, chances are whoever whoever you uh, upended and tossed over the railing, hopefully if they're okay, they're going to get over it. Oh, there it is. Beautiful. There's the ball. Right here on my desk. Anybody and sign cubed. it? Cubed. No, no, no. I, it's in the same condition it is from the game. Here's the one I got a spring training here. See, it's got a little different. See, here's the ball here. This is just a regular ball. Audience can't see it. This one, regular ball. This one, spring training. And they're both, they're both baseballs, but they have different, you know, different artwork uh, to commemorate different things. When the Mets were playing the, I guess it was the Dodgers in the 70s, I was at Shea, because I grew mm -hmm. up in Florida. I was probably 12 years old. And mm -hmm. Dusty was playing for the Dodgers, I guess. And um, I, he was coming in and I yelled. And I was able to reach. That was the only one I got from Dusty Baker. Oh, cool. Yeah, Dusty it was pretty, Baker? Wait, Dusty Baker? Yeah, when he was playing. Yeah, when he was playing. That's awesome. Wow. 
Yeah, he's the he's the manager. It was the Nationals manager. Now I think he's with the uh, Astros. I will tell you this, and, and I don't on an interesting note. It might have been the same team, but somebody was yelling at the players. And of course, Shea Stadium in the seventies, eighties. You know, mm-hmm. they were yelling at the players in the uh, dugout of the opposing team, and, and and one of the players was making obscene gestures towards. <laughs> The guys in my, in my, and then we were out. In Typical New York fans. We were out in left field, and yep. the guy yelling at the outfielder. I'm not going to say who it was because I don't want to do it. But he was taking his guys in the outfield were screaming at him. He was taking and, and giving flipping the bird so the camera couldn't see it, but everyone, all of us, could see it. One of the outfielders. Pretty pretty wild, huh? That's so, that is wild. But we're coming not up to the, the end of our show. Not the name. I think Bobby, right, Bobby? We're at the end. Just about, sir. Got a couple minutes. You can wrap it up, you know. We'll wrap it up. Any any last uh, – actually, uh, Steve, can you tell us a little thing about, you know, what the, the first responders are doing in New York? And we'll close it out that way with a little tribute to the first responders and everybody that's out there helping fight this thing. Well, from the guys I know that are still active, you know, I'm retired, but they tell me – see, inherently – you know, by nature, firemen, I can speak for firemen, mm-hmm. the firehouse is never closed. So we live to. Oh, we just lost Steve at the end. We're closed. Oh, so no, he's back. Quarters. In and out. And guys do their best to, uh, but, it, it, you know, it's a tough situation because we're not going to not be there. So right. any things that can spread, it's, you know, I'm guessing that the guys are really uh, up against it. Not well, why, only- can't, why can't the fire department work from home? Well, John, because I'm kidding. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh, 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 some people no, but some people ask that. John, I know, I, I know. John, I, 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 I well, <laughs> had someone ask me once if if the if we don't have to respond to fires in the rain because the rain puts it out. And <laughs> I think we just lost Steve. Um, now, as far as the first responders, I know the guys are probably times a hundred the calls that are going on and oh, uh, yeah. out the firehouse but living in the firehouse too they're in close quarters and uh yeah. with this virus they have to contend yeah. with it do it's any all one big minutes. open thing yeah yeah sure so you know but yeah. here's the thing every one of them wouldn't say no to do it anyway so they're gonna yeah. even the volunteers are still going you know i was a volunteer this all, all it's amazing they're all going out but at least they can they live at home and they go to the firehouse for Call so they they can kind of stay apart at least part of the time unless unless yeah. they're on the call. But uh, anyway, Steve, thank you so much for for tuning in. We got to wrap it up. We're starting to lose your signal. My unfortunately. pleasure. Unfortunately, having thank, me. And thanks to all the first responders, doctors, nurses, everybody that's out there helping to fight this, and the and the uh, the, the uh, all the delivery people are still delivering you know things that people need, and all the people that are at the stores supermarkets and everything that uh, helping people stay fed. So thank you to everybody and stay safe and we'll see you next week. Next week. I think we're going to have Pat Marone. As awesome. Our, uh, another left to saves lives guy on the, uh, as a special guest goes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Producer Bobby. And uh, we'll see you again next week.